Well, good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you here this morning. Uh, before we begin our or continue our study of dealing with Samson and Delilah, uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and love, for all your mercy towards us, for the way that you have worked upon our hearts in these studies, for the light that you have given us, and for the people who are searching for truth and continue to watch these studies. We just ask, Lord, that you can help us as we continue to go through these passages as we put the, the line of Samson as we lay it out. Um, we just ask, Lord, that you can correct any thinking that we may have and that you can um, provide insight and light. Forgive us for our sins. Help us to trust in you in all things. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So good morning, everyone, again. Um, now, we had addressed yesterday uh, Samson and Delilah, and we had begun to draw it a line. And we've noted that there that Samson and Delilah is a repeat of history. And trying to understand this, this chapter is, uh, one is it's very involved. There's lots of symbols, and uh, these symbols such as the three, four combination uh, that we have in these uh, Delilah trying to find out the strengths of Samson. So the, basically the four times that he's bound, three when he can escape. And of course the fourth when his hair is cut off and he can be bound. Um, so that would represent of course a, a complete line in and of itself. And uh, then we have all of these symbols uh, at the beginning, midnight, uh, the lines uh, symbolized by the gates and the posts, the chiasms. Um, and uh, then we have, you know, the 1100 pieces of silver. So we just have multitudes of symbols, Gaza itself uh, being a symbol the 16th day of the first month, dealing with 16 verse 1. So when we, um, and even, uh, you know, some of the, some of the other passages, uh, just dealing with some of the numbers, you know, seven um, showing up in these, in these verses. And, um, the weaving uh, machine, warp and woof, um, and uh, and then you're going to, of course, have the death of Samson in the Temple of Dagon. So there's just a lot in here. I mean, you know, I don't think it's as simple as just saying we can we can just lay out this line. Um, there is. You know, I mean, you could you could take this as representing a lot of history, not just what is presently happening now. But that's what we've been trying to do is is to focus how these the story of the judges relates to 9/11 to 2023. Now, Judges 16, even though the other ones point us to April 5th, 2030, Judges 16 um, drives the point home. I mean, it 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 definitely is tied to that future date. And so that's what we're, we're struggling with. Now, when we looked at this yesterday, and, and I'll just bring up the chart. So here we had put at the beginning, Colin and Odilio study as the arrival of the first message and as uh, the formalization. Now, the reason why we did that is we saw that uh, the, the verses, um, verse one brought us up to the end of the 777 structure. And 
so this, um, and that's the, going to be the period of darkness. So when Colin and Stephen uh, present us with these insights, uh, that's that those messages are tied together. Um, and Stephen's, of course, dealing with the 777 and the 321. It's interesting, Iran pointed out that the study yesterday uh, was 321 on this understanding the lines. And so we we didn't intentionally talk about 321, but it was a major part of our study going through these different 321s. And um, so now we're, we're looking at Samson and Delilah and trying to draw out the rest of this line. <clears throat> so um, I, I hardly know where to start. All I know is that we have to find out what the empowerment of the first message is, what event it is, and how it, how it would be illustrated. Now, when it comes to uh, Collins' um, study being, of course, the arrival of the message with the formalization being Odilio's, uh, we have with Odilio's this 629, that's going to be Pentecost, the wheat harvest. Collins is at the wave offering. So that's going to be seven weeks from the beginning of the um, this period with the wave offering to Pentecost. And so it's formalized February 12, 2022. Um, so whatever this empowerment is, whatever date or event that we would mark, it would have to be related to this message that has arrived and we need to understand what that is. So any thoughts about that? Has anybody taken time to consider what, what event in our movement would mark this first angel arriving? Because what is this message specifically that arrives on December 25th, 2021? Anybody? Well, I mean, the, the, the message as he, it was, a, we call it the Trump prediction, not mistaken. Okay. Um, and it had to do with Trump becoming reelected or coming back into the to the uh, the limelight per se. Okay. Now, I don't think that's what the, what message actually arrived. I mean, that's how we would say what Collins' message is. Right. But, but that I don't think is the message itself. Can you articulate? Well, because we have Stephen's message as well, and Odilio's. These, so Odilio's is a formalization of that. And it's connected to the 777. So Colin is presenting something, but what he's presenting, he doesn't even realize. This I can accept. Okay, right. So he's presenting something that we need to understand what that, that is. Because I, I don't know if we've we've fully grasped what Colin was presenting. So try to think of it in more an abstract way. You know, what is the principle that Colin is presenting, not what is his conclusion? Because I don't think it's about Trump, right? So he mistakenly believes that this is Trump, but it's not. So what about not understanding um, chronology? Because there's a lot of chronology in what he's saying. Okay. I mean, that's this is how he got all of his numbers. 
Right. So, right. So it's definitely related to chronology, especially when you consider Stephen's uh, revelation. Right. So we have to put these two together. Two of the, these both come together at the same time, and they're bearing witness to each other. So, I mean, Colin's prediction or Colin's Colin's study, right? It relates to understanding. The, the, go the golden image in Daniel 3. Right. Um, uh, Daniel 11, verse 1 to 4. And <clears throat> which is addressing the time of the end in um, at the beginning of the decrees. Right. Because it's going to because if we think what what that study is, Daniel 11, verse 1 to 4, what is that study? How would Jeff see that study? How did he see it when we found it out? What did he say it was? So he said it was Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. And, and if we think back, when we found this out, it was related <coughs> to our initial prediction regarding Trump, right? That Trump would be elected. And were we correct? Uh, the first time. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so that means we had um, made a correct application of those verses seeing that the, the end and the beginning were connected. We know that Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45 is the main verse that this movement is based upon. Did I say that right? The I main, don't know. I'll say it again. Main verse that this movement is based upon. Yes, right? Yeah, 11, 11, 40, something to 45. Yeah. Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Right, because that's the whole thing that gives us the repeat of history, the time of the end being uh, 1989. Right. And it's it's addressing the coming Sunday law. Yeah, definitely Jeff would have seen it like that. Right. So when he found that we could look at the beginning and we could see um, that the, the, the beginning part of that was addressing our present history – what we were going through, um, that just continued to expand, right? So initially, we looked at Daniel 11, verse 1 to 4. We could see that um, the history in connection with the start of the three decrees was tied to the time of the end in 1798. Because the three decrees is a, is a reform line that begins the 2300 days. Uh, the Three Angels' Messages is a reform line that begins um, uh, or ends the 2300 days, right? And it comes at the time of the end that we already had recognized as the time of the end. And we could recognize then that 537 is the time of the end. And, and this all came together because I was studying uh, the chronology in the Babylonian captivity. So this movement hadn't been studying that, right? They weren't really looking at that chronology. It didn't mean anything to them at first, right? They, they, and one is they had wrong dates, so they couldn't have put that Leviticus 26 was fulfilled in periods of 70 years because they didn't, they didn't have that. Right? They didn't have the correct chronology to see that. They wouldn't have seen... Uh, the 490 years from uh, 1097 to 607, for instance. And so they wouldn't have connected all these things, these verses together. So the first thing that we had to do is we had to be able to recognize this. And, um, and, and I happened to be the one that recognized this. So this wasn't understood uh, before I came into the movement. So I started to 
lay out this chronology and see that, you know, there's these periods of, of 70 years and how they're all connected and how um, they're the four seven times from Leviticus 26 fulfilled for literal Israel and how the three decrees are all marking the ends of these periods. And so this, this became extremely important um, in understanding the Trump prediction in the first place, right? So we need to understand the background of what it is we have to understand to get to where we were. And um, so when Stephen introduced the 777 years from 457 to 321 AD to the Sunday law on a date that we had symbolically marked as the Sunday law, and that Colin is addressing Daniel 3, which is about the Sunday law, right? And Daniel 11, verse 1 to 4, which was necessary for us to even have the Trump prediction in the first place. And, and then he introduced Revelation 17 and how these things were tied together. So what was Colin really doing, whether he was aware of it or not? Could it be said that he was helping us to establish some way marks? Okay. Well, yes, he helps us establish some way marks, but he helps us understand the basis for how we came to our conclusion in the first place, the pieces of the puzzle that were necessary for us to be where we were. Now, he also presents Miller's rules in that study, right? So he tries to make the argument that if we follow Miller's rules, we should come to this conclusion that Persia is the United States and that Daniel 11, when it introduces uh, this king, right, which we always had interpreted as Alexander the Great, when it introduces this king and the way that it's described is um, and a, a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion. And we said that that was Alexander. He tries to argue, and 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 we need to understand his his thinking. So we have Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Rome pagan, Rome papal, and then divided Rome, modern Rome, the foot of the image in Daniel two. But in the Sunday Law, in Daniel three, it's a solid image all the way through as gold. Now, what's the significance of that in connection to the Sunday law? What does that tell us, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's golden image? So the head's not just gold, but the whole thing is gold. Yeah, the, the whole, whole um, image is golden. So it, doesn't that mean that it's all going to be like in unison? Okay, so there's these powers are united at the end. Right. right. Now, what what Colin is saying, and I don't think he said it very well, I don't think he he connected all the dots for us, but but what I think was underlying his his connection is that the reason he could say it's United States, it's Persia all the way, is because he's looking at this golden image and saying, well, it's gold all the way down. So we can just go here and we can say these kings are going to be the uh, Persia all the way, or going to be the United States. Because at the end of the- I think the that's world, what he was implying. Yeah, he didn't say it that way. At least I've never heard him say it. No, that way. I didn't hear him say it that way, but that yeah. was what he, it, to me, it's what it seemed like to imply. Well, that's what struck me, right? Because when you deal with the Sunday law, um, this is all of the, it's, it's a united power right? The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are all united in this Sunday law. Now, 
So he says, well, it's the United States, which I would agree. That is, when we look at the mighty king, Alexander, um, you know, he's Greece. But Greece conquers Persia, right? Correct. So that means that the United States must be conquered by Greece, by the globalists, which is what we saw, right? Well, we saw it, yes. Yeah, okay. So, so we had seen this. We saw January 6th, and Colin saw it too. But then he makes the mistake of saying, well, it's got to be Trump again. And that's what I could not understand. Because Trump is not a globalist. And it wasn't about Trump. Even our Trump prediction wasn't really about Trump. Right? There is... <laughs> There's a person that fulfills a role that's symbolized prophetically, happens to be Trump. But it's it's something that happens in the United States. I mean, to say that the king, a mighty king that shall stand up, has to be a particular person doesn't really make any sense when we're applying it prophetically. The reason why we have Trump is because we're making an application within the United States of these presidents, right? And Trump fulfills his role. It's completed. And then when we look at Revelation 17, then we needed to understand Revelation 17 correctly. And, and it doesn't undo what we understood before. That is, we don't just don't, you know, scrap our understanding. What we needed to recognize is that we were making an application of Revelation 17 that, that really didn't apply. So when he tried to apply Revelation 17 in the way that he did, uh, to say that Trump is going to be the eighth, it's sort of missing the point of what the eighth is. Right, because we know this this has to do with the symbol of the resurrection. And so I'm not going to do a whole study on that, but we did do a whole study on it. We went through this and tried to understand what this meant. And the way that it was understood by the pioneers is that the eighth was the United States. That is, Revelation 13, where we have this image of the beast that spake as a dragon, that's the eighth head. And if you think about Alexander, I mean, Alexander is Greek, but he's doing something. He's uniting uh, basically the world. He creates this world empire. And and I don't think you could say that. I mean, we talk about these, we talk about them as world empires. But Babylon is not a world empire. And Alexander's kingdom, I mean, really would say that Rome is really that first universal kingdom. Now, of course, we're not including China and other things. We're dealing with the powers that are affecting um, uh, God's people. So, so what is Colin's study? We know it's it's about chronology. We know it's about how we came to that understanding. But it is a um, a message that relates to the Sunday law to the coming Sunday law. So Odilio's presentation is a formalization of that. And how is it a formalization of that?
what is it that Odilio brings to the table there that uh, is a formalization of Colin's message? The showbread. Okay. Um, Can I ask a question, Pedro? What's that? A question? Can I ask yeah, you can ask a question. Well, um, I'm going to play, I don't want to say David's advocate, but I'm going to play, um, I'm going to ask, uh, where, where's the Sunday law in all this? Thing? Where did it take place? For Because the United States has to make an image to the beach, right? Yeah. So where does that, um, where does that come into play at? Well, so the image of to the beast is is part of what we, we understand happened with the pandemic. So you're saying the image of the beast is the pandemic? No. It's typified by the pandemic. Typified the, typified the image of the beast typifies the... Yeah. So what we had illustrated is what's going to happen in the future, right? It was a type. So, so we know that we had a type of the image of the beast and a type of the Sunday. That is, we saw unfolding how this is going to happen in the future on, 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 on a worldwide scale. I mean, what we saw was pretty much worldwide, right? We saw that they could put everything into motion using fear, right? And this is what we understand would happen in connection with the Sunday law. But we can't say it was the Sunday law because then we're making the same error that Parminder's group made when they tried to say, well, the Sunday law is going to be about, um, you know, human rights. Well, at least they were on a saying, well, that's not about Sunday. But if we try to say, well, it's about the Constitution and human rights, um, but a different type of human rights, but it's not about Sunday, well, we're saying the Sunday law isn't about Sunday. Now, of course, what they're saying is it's the Sunday law, it's the beginning of it, and it's going to work its way into a Sunday law. But I couldn't see how that is even remotely related. Um, because on the one hand, you have the religious right opposed to that Sunday law. Right? Hey, well, you got another question? Wait, um, what? If both the pandemic and the uh, image of the beach represent the type of the Sunday law, I don't. I don't understand how it's a type. Well, it's not the Sunday law, but it looks like the Sunday law, right? So you have the government coming in and um, setting aside the Constitution, uh, bringing in mandates, forcing the conscience. All of those things happen in a Sunday law except they happen about Sunday, right? So until it happens about Sunday, it's not a Sunday law. And the idea then that, you know, this, uh, the mandates would just kind of morph into a Sunday law, didn't make sense to me because you have the religious right opposed to the mandates. And those are the people that are supposed to be uh, enforcing the Sunday law. So what would be more likely is that you would get a reaction that is the king of the south defeated the king of the north. Right? This is still typical, right? Remember, it's not it's not um, it's not the Sunday law part yet, but it but it it happens. So January 6th you have that happen. But then we know that the king of the north has to defeat the king of the south. So we end up having this reaction. And so the religious right, it is going to react to what happened 
over the last few years, not just in the connection with um, the pandemic, but also BLM and uh, you know the riots and of course all the wokeism, all of these things. Everything's being set up for these things to be um, overturned. You know, that is, we're going to swing to the right, so to speak. You know, not that I think it's actually the right, but, you know, we use that term, the, uh, the right, left and right wing, which is really bad terms, doesn't really describe anything. But anyway, it's going to move to um, uh, what we would call conservative values. And, and they're not going to be any better than what we have now, even though we may agree with some of those values. Um, they're going to be enforced in some way. And, you know, we're still going to have the same sort of uh, methods, right? There's going to be fear. Right? There's, there's going to be civil war. All of these things are going to happen. Now, the argument that Colin makes is that it's Trump, which makes no sense if we understand Daniel 11, verse uh, 1 to 4, because it's it's a different power. Our mighty king, not the mighty king. It's not Xerxes who who conquers Persia. I mean, it's it's Greece that conquers Persia. And that's already happened, right? We, we understand that that's happened. And so it's not now about when it says a mighty king, when we try to look for a person that it is, one thing we can say is it's not Biden. Right? No, he's weak. Right. So Biden's a puppet. So whoever this mighty king is, I don't think it's a particular person. When it came to the presidents of the United States, we could line them up. But this isn't a president of the United States that conquers the United States because Persia is the U.S. So this mighty king has to be something else. And, and we don't fully understand. We still don't know exactly how to understand what Colin presented, but what he presented wasn't what he thought he was presenting. Or at least he may have understood part of it, but to, to draw the conclusion that he did, part of it is because he doesn't understand the lines, right? Because he hasn't been studying the lines. So it's, it's sort of a, you know, an incomplete picture that he has which leads him to draw a wrong conclusion. But we should not throw out the baby with the bathwater. We need to examine what it is that he presented. Now, I think stuff that he presented later is a lot weaker. That is, you know, what he was initially stating, based on what he had there to look at, I could see how he could draw that it's going to be Trump. But based on what has unfolded and even the chronology that he has presented should draw him away from the idea that it's Trump, but it's still not, right? That is, as more light has unfolded regarding these lines, we should readily see that Trump can't fulfill the symbolism that's being presented by Colin. But also, especially with Odilio, and that's why it didn't make sense to me when Odilio said basically what he had presented there, that somehow this supported what Colin was saying about Trump. It actually doesn't, doesn't support Trump at all. It, it, there was no connection. There was no logical connection between what he had presented about the mandates because these mandates, did they come under Trump? Uh, no, sir. No, no. they didn't. So, so if, if they came under this power that conquered the United States, the globalists, then you can't possibly say that, that these relate to Trump. 
that Trump's going to come in and he's going to continue these mandates, Trump would overturn them, right? You see the contradiction of what they were saying about the mandates and what they were predicting about Trump. Yeah, and, and now Trump is being indicted again. Yeah, well, I don't think any of that matters. <clears throat> well, it may have some political uh, uh, ramifications. Yeah, but I don't think we should look at, at the politics of it and trying to decide, you know, if that makes sense, whether Trump's going to come back into power or not. No, I would just make it a statement. That's all. Yeah. Because some people, you know, they can argue, well, see, Trump's unpopular right now and so forth. And, you know, we can't see him coming back into power. But that would mean nothing if the prophecy showed us that Trump was going to come into power. Then we would know that he's going to. Wouldn't matter what we see. Right. It just shows us that he's not. Right. That he's not the one who brings in the Sunday law. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We've decided that that wasn't. That wasn't happening. It so doesn't of, appear to be the Greeks. Yeah. So one of the things about Persia, I mean, we talk about these kingdoms that, you know, conquers, conquer um, Israel, right? Babylon destroys the temple. But Persia, which represents the United States, it, it's going to come at the time of the end, Right just like the United States comes at the time of the end in 1798. And it's going to establish, because Persia is about the law of the Medes and the Persians, the United States is about the constitution that is established. But in order for Persia to no longer be protecting God's people, it has to be defeated. Right? It's defeated by Greece. And so... When it's defeated by Greece, um, and, and that happens before, you know, Alexander. I mean, Alexander's just the mighty king that comes up, that stands up, right? And his kingdom is then going to be divided. Now, does that represent the United States? I don't think so. Not at all. Right. So when we look at Greece and we look no, at it this, does not. Yeah. That it's going to be divided. It's going to be a, about the world, right? Greece is the world. Correct. Right? And that's why I say Greece is the first world kingdom. Because you don't really see that. I mean, you could actually argue that Egypt is, in a sense, the world kingdom, but because uh, it symbolizes it much more than Persia does. Okay, now I have a question, and this, this will relate directly to something that we see on the 1843 chart. Yeah, okay. Okay, so mm -hmm. we agree Greece is divided, but when we're looking down the chart, just under the cross on the 1843 chart, we have the symbol of 490. Yeah. And the pioneers, as they produced this chart, this chart that was ordained by the hand of God, mm -hmm. how do they see 490? Well, what it says here, um, something of Rome completed. Can't see what that word is. Okay. Completed or, or not completed, completed into the kingdoms. Uh, I can't read it here on this chart. What does it say? Okay. Hang on. I will, I'll see if I can pull up a better copy. Okay. okay. Forty-three chart. Is that what you're looking at? Yep. He charted his four nine on there. <laughs> okay. So, if I'm if I'm looking at this correctly, it should say division. Division. Division of Rome completed into ten kingdoms. 
Now, we know... Yeah, that's what I see. Okay. We know that Greece, after the death of Alexander, is divided into four kingdoms. Mm -hmm. In 490, according to the historian of the history of Florence... The book first of Lloyd, I, I can barely read this. So, yeah. Division of Rome completed into 10 kingdoms. See Marquivial, the historian in history of Florence. Yeah, Florence book. Yep. First, the first book. Yeah. Bishop Lloyd and Loth's commentary. Um, yeah. And also Dr. Hale's analysis of chronology. Right. So Greece is divided and then Rome is divided. Right? Yeah. So in this situation, Persia is conquered. Then Greece takes the stage and Greece is divided. Yeah. Those are literal historical facts. Mm hmm yeah, and it's fairly rapid, too. Exactly. But it does not say that Persia is divided. No, it's actually becomes united. Okay. So it's going to be conquered by Greece. Right. Persia, which began as the Medes and the Persians, began as two powers combined is conquered by a power that then becomes four right. that power is yeah. then conquered by a power that becomes ten right yeah. so when all of this with Colin looking to Trump He's trying to say that Persia is going to be the one that brings in the Sunday law when all of this is done, beginning with that which was of Greece, and then is led into this with what, what begins with Rome. Because in Revelation, don't we see that there will be 10 kings for one hour? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So doesn't yeah. doesn't yeah. the Bible then stand against some of Collins' logical presentation? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. The, the other thing we need to consider is, is we compare the twelve sixty with the seventy, right? Ellen White does. Amen. Yes. Okay. So the twelve sixty are barely much in captivity as they were when they were in captivity to Babylon, God's people. And so we see the time of the end there. We see Babylon. At the time of the end, Persia rises, right? Which parallels the United States. But then the United States is, is going to be conquered by Greece. And that has happened. Now, in order for the United States as a dragon, That means it first has to be conquered by Greece. That is, we, we, and the way that Ellen White puts it, it has to do with this threefold union, reaching the hand to the papacy and, and reaching the other hand to uh, the dragon, right? So, grasp the hand of spiritualism. The, the, the question that, that, um, started all this was um, what was Colin's message, message. telling us that mm -hmm. um, and it was telling us unwittingly on Colin's part right <clears throat> so, hey, the focus so is kind of, we've kind of lost the yeah. focus of that 
No, not really. No, we haven't lost the focus. This is what I'm trying to get to. Okay. So if we look at this, if we look at, if we follow Miller's rules correctly, we need to see the parallels between these histories. And we have have to follow those parallels as they are laid out historically. So So let me go back to that question. Yeah. Okay. What did we find out? We found out that he, you know, he was talking about Miller's rules, but he wasn't actually following. Right. Which I tried to point out that he wasn't following Miller's rules in his conclusion. Well, yeah, but that was a little offensive to him. And it still is. Well, yeah, I know, because I've talked to him about it. Right. And I tried to point out exactly where he departed from Miller's rules. Yeah, I yeah. sense it in his demeanor and, and his speech. Yeah, but, you know, that happens. I mean, uh, and, and, and I tried to do it the nicest way I could. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm, I wasn't mean about it or anything. But, but we can see quite clearly that when does the United States reach its hand to the papal power? Has that happened in history yet? Well, a long time um, ago, right? It's uh, it's already happened, hasn't it? Reagan, yeah, don't, say it all. Yeah. don't we consider so, it? Okay, yeah, well, I was uh, I was wondering who was being mean to him. What? Who was being mean to Colin? Nobody. Well, you just said it. Um, you weren't being mean about it. Yeah, I wasn't being mean about it. Yeah. Well, neither was nobody else, I don't think. No. I, I didn't sense that at all. No, so I haven't been mean to Colin because he's a good friend. I mean, I have nothing against him. I just think he's making a mistake in how he's applying Miller's rules. Okay. You point out right, a right. mistake of somebody. If you say that that's being mean, then, then I'm being mean. But I think it's actually mean not to point out a person's mistake. If I'm making a mistake and somebody doesn't point it out, that's pretty mean. But anyway, let's go get off of that. Let's just look at what we're saying here about what Colin was presenting. So he was presenting a model which, if we were to look at it, was giving us an answer about our Trump prediction. Trump is Xerxes. It's very, very clear. He can't be Alexander. This was the mistake that Jeff was making because he was trying to say, well, what's going to happen is Trump is going to become president, right? And after he becomes president, because this is before he was president, then he's going to become the head of the UN. And that's how the United States is then going to unite the world under this Sunday law, because the United States would be in charge of the UN. But when we look at what actually happened, when when the United States joined hands with the papacy, uh, how do we place that in the history of Persia, for instance? Does Persia unite with Rome at any time in its history? Not that I recall. I don't think so. Okay, so so we we can't, I mean, when does Rome begin? What do we know about the history of Rome? Yeah, but don't Rome typify the United States? Yeah, I know. So this is what we need to figure out. So we got Medo-Persia. Um... Do they have any connection? I mean, what's in the history of Rome? And I'm just trying to find the chart here. Uh, I mean, so the Roman Republic begins uh, in 509, right? That's the Roman Republic, but Rome was founded, according to tradition, about 753 B.C. Yeah, so it's going to be founded earlier. And um, 
but but the point that I have here is that Persia can't really be connected to Rome because Rome doesn't really exist as a power, right? I mean, right. They're, they're far apart. But there has to be something that connects them to Rome, at least symbolically. So, so what could we have that connects Persia to Rome in, in, in a symbol? Their armies? Okay, explain. Well, the Persian armies were known for being the best at their time, and then Rome, as it came on the scene, was known for having even a more superior army. The only time that Greece had a great army was under Alexander alone. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and, and, and the Roman armies, well, there's a whole bunch of history dealing with the Roman military and how it operated and, and how it led to ultimately the fall of the Roman Empire. Because they, they hired merc mercenary armies, especially in their later history. They just hired armies. But um, uh, so we, anyway, we have the Roman Republic. Um, and this, you know, starts, I mean, Rome is growing as a kingdom in this time. So, so Persia, I mean, it comes in contact with God's people. It's going to conquer Babylon. It's going to be conquered by Greece. And Persia, um, Now, it's under Persia that we're going to have this type of the Sunday law, right? So the story of, of um, Esther. So in the story of Esther, Esther, do we have any Romans? No. Okay. What do we have, though, that could in some way connect to that? that would connect us to Rome? Yeah, is there anything that connects us to Rome in the story of Esther? Not that I recall. Okay. Okay, so here, and, and... Now, of course, Rome is Italy, right? Italy is... Um, part of I mean it's it's this sort of peninsula or whatever you want to call it I guess it's the Roman peninsula now how is it related to Greece what are these um, well it, or could you put, could you um, attach the Sunday law to um, Persia and Rome well yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Can we? I mean, we do have Haman. So what is Haman? Can the point is, can he symbolize the papacy? Because the United States connects with the papacy. Okay, so if you take Haman to symbolize the papacy, that would mean that the Amalekites would symbolize the papacy, right? Okay. Um, now Haman is um, also a Macedonian, which would we would normally say Greek, but it's Northern Greece, right? Okay, I can I can buy into that. Okay. But don't we also trace Haman's lineage to the king of the Amalekites? Okay, and that might be a better connection. Because what I see is in that history of Esther, because this is something that precedes the third angel arriving, right? Okay. Because the third angel is Artax Artaxerxes' decree. 
And in this history, we also know it's a type of the Sunday law. Because it's not about Sunday, but it's just like the pandemic, it's a type of the Sunday law. So, so we have um, Haman, and, and maybe that's the best way to connect him is to... And, and how would that how would that connect us? How would you describe that connection? Okay. Haman being a descendant of the king of the Amalekites that Saul was to have destroyed. Had, destroyed. He was to have passed judgment upon him. Yeah. The Amalekites, as a warlike people were also a gutless warlike people because they wanted to attack the weak, the aged, and the infirm. Okay. But they were seeking the destruction of the children of Israel. They were seeking the destruction of God's people. Yeah. So when the instruction was given for the sentence to be passed upon Haman's predecessor. Saul chose not to do what he was supposed to do, but Samuel took upon himself at the, at the instruction of God that this man and his entire family were to be put to death. So if we were doing that, this would be similar to those that at the end have seen what has gone on with the beast and have seen their destruction. And they've, they, they stand aside to watch the destruction occurring. Don't we see that in Revelation? Okay. So I, I think that that answers our question. That at least in type, under the period of time that we we have um, this, in the story of Esther, under the second angel's message, right, you're going to have this uh, Haman who comes in and he brings in this type of the Sunday law, right, and right. and and Xerxes aligns with him. Right, this Macedonian, who's not a Persian, who's descended from the Amalekites. So, but they're gonna, uh, but Xerxes is also defeated. I mean, previously he's going to be defeated by Greece. Right, because it's it's going to be after the defeat of Greece that this occurs. So I, I still don't know if that's the best answer, but um, you know maybe there's something that I don't know. But all I know is that if we're going to look at the history of Persia, um, we could say that Persia is it's a type of the United States. But ultimately, it's defeated by Greece. It makes it makes. Um, now, in our history, is when the United States is defeated by the papacy, because really it is. In some ways, though, it's more an alliance. Well, it's, it's definitely a, an alliance. Yeah. What what it's, is what is one of the main symbols of the United States? main symbols yeah what's one of the main symbols of the united states if you were you if, thank you yeah, and what was what is one of the main symbols of imperial rome what's the eagle the eagle also of the third reich okay but see the third reich was trying to pattern itself according to whom and according to what It went pure, pure pagan. I mean, I know they admired the Roman gods and all that crap. <laughs> the the Third Reich was trying to pattern itself after Rome. Mm -hmm. So 
here you have an eagle as the symbol of Rome, as part of the standard of Rome, and you have the eagle as part of the symbol of the United States. Mm -hmm. And this, this goes right to the point that you're making, that this is an alliance with Rome. Yeah. Now, is it an alliance with Greece? No. Well, it, it's defeated by Greece. The United States. Okay. The United States has accepted the Greek method of education. Yeah. The United States has accepted the media method of governance wow. and it has taken the place of Babylon as a premier nation. Mm -hmm. So could we also not accept that what has been the United States has been raised up as the figure on the plain of Dura? Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So so right now this threefold union has been forming. Right. Right. Right in front of our eyes. Right. The image of the beast is being formed. But it and, and I'm saying that in the history of Persia, I mean, once they get their temple rebuilt, I mean they're gonna have this uh um you know, Darius, and then they're going to have, uh, <clears throat> uh, after Darius, they're going to have Xerxes, right? So, so the history of Darius more aligns with, um, part of the Millerite history. I mean, it, it's hard to, there's still things I'm not certain about on how to, to look at the three decrees, but we do know that, what's that? You know, that's the reason I brought up the image of the beast in Saul, because I thought, I thought both of them got the same, the pandemic and the image of the beast got the same characteristic as the, putting the image to the beast. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the reason I brought it up, and I was, I'm still looking through the spirit of prophecy on the image of the beast. So, but I think it's, I think they both symbolized each other and that's the reason I brought it up. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when we look at this Daniel 11 verse 1 to 4, right, it's going to start with Darius the Mede, right, so it's going to start with Darius the Mede, he parallels Reagan. Um, but of course, we know that this is in the time of who? When Daniel 11 is given, who, who's the king? It's Cyrus, right? So he goes back to Darius. He mentions Reagan. But this is at the time of the end. This is 1989. So who's the king at this time? Bush the first. Right. So it's in the time of Bush the first. And he says, yet three kings will stand up. Right. Of course, in that time, it's Cambyses, small, false Smyrdas, and Darius the Great. Right, drives the Persian. And so we line those up with these presidents of the United States. And so we line up Darius the Persian with um, um, Obama, right? So Darius the Great, he's the one that we line up. And then we say that, well, the next is going to be the fourth, and he shall be far richer than they all. We said that was going to be Trump. It happened to right. be Trump. 
and he's going to stir all up against the realm of Grisha. Trump definitely did that. Right? So he, he fought a war against the globalists. Does he win? Trump loses, no, he right? loses, correct. And then we know that that's not the end of that history, right? That is, we know there's all this history of Medo-Persia and Greece that are going on. But then finally, Greece is going to get this um, kingdom, right? This mighty kingdom or mighty king, he shall stand up. So Alexander is going to create this. Now, this can't be Trump. It's not the mighty king. It's a mighty king. He's going to rule with great dominion and do according to his will. So who would this be? Or what is this? I mean, it's even more than just Greece, right? I would have to agree. Yeah. So, but then we're going to see, of course, in this history, when you have this kingdom that's divided to the four winds of heaven and, and all this stuff that follows, well, this is now not just continuing. We're not going to take this application and saying we're going to follow from, from this when this mighty king stands up and on all the rest is the history that's in the future. We know that it, we're going to apply it as a repeat and enlarge. Right? Daniel 11 is going to keep repeating itself. Agreed. And giving different details. And so there was disagreement in the movement on how we do some of this. Um, but I would think that when we compare this character here, this must be the papacy. That even though this is Alexander, and which is Greece, I mean, this is a world empire. And so, I mean, this this is, in a sense, it's it's the UN, right? So it's 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 more and the and the Pope is a globalist, isn't he? Agreed. Like, I would say so. So we see the, the world moving towards this one world government, towards globalism. The United States has been defeated. And, and so the problem that I have in trying to understand what's going to happen, which I think, you know, that's what our study is trying to help us, not, not just to know the details of what's going to happen, but to understand the principles that are involved and, and what the prophecies are saying about the future. The problem that I have is that in order for the United States to give the Sunday law, we just say, well, it's the religious right. But they're opposed to the globalists, right? So when we take this idea of the king of the north and the king of the south, this political you know, interplay that occurs, it's going to appear to those that are bringing in the Sunday law that they're doing something good, right? that they're correcting wrongs in the past. And we know that these powers unite to do that. Why do they do that when these powers are really essentially uh, have different goals? I mean, they have the same goal, but for themselves. So why do they unite? Why does the United States end up giving a Sunday law for the world? What has to happen? Why are these powers uniting? Because of a crisis? Well, I don't think it's just that there's a crisis. Yeah. I don't think that there's just a crisis. So they have their goals. Each one thinks that it's going to be the one that ends up on the top. Right. Right. The papacy, of course, will end up on the top.
but everybody it's all about self-interest and and self-interest i mean, mean on a sort of universal scale because there's self-interest all the individuals have self-interest but there's a goal or an ideology or whatever it is that believes that its ends will be achieved by this union and but then that's hard to imagine for me i mean it's hard to imagine um you know with the present state of things uh to see um the woke left and the religious right united in a sunday law so people have tried to figure this out you know is it an environmental sunday law well that's not going to sit well with the religious right they're not going to say well yeah we, we like the sunday law idea but we know it comes along with all these other things so you know, I still have had, as a Seventh-day Adventist, I've had a hard time seeing how a Sunday law comes about. But I have a much better picture of it than I would have had 40 years ago. People do the strangest things in crises. Yeah. Well, I don't even think it's just that it's a crisis. I mean, they create the crisis themselves. Pretty much. Right. So, I mean, the crisis is just an excuse to act. But, but it does... It does cause people to make decisions that they wouldn't have made, to support things that if they thought rationally, they wouldn't support. I mean, I don't think you're going to see, you know, 10 years from now, many people who are going to admit uh, that they um, supported what we see in the media today. Mm. Right? Just like, you know, you're not going to see many people today who you know, say they listen to the Spice Girls, right? You know, you, you, you rewrite history. Um, I spring that up because I had this student who wanted to learn Spice Girl songs. And I said, you're, you're never going to ever admit that you like them. You know, he's like 10 years old. And, and later <laughs> on, I taught him and he said, I, I brought it up and he says, I, I tried to forget about that. Don't remind me. But anyway. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying, that people will change what their opinion was at the time. And, and part of that is because people's opinions aren't really their opinions. People's opinions are what they think other people want them to think. Right? You know, I found this out during the pandemic by talking to customers and, and they were scared, you know, to share their opinion until they realized what my opinion was, and then they were happy to share it. Oh, but, yeah. I've met, and and I've they would even say, I, I, can't, I can't talk about this at work. I can't say these things. You know, I can't, you know, with my relatives mention any of this. Now, of course, they might find that some of these people that they, you know, can't talk to, if they knew what they thought, they would be able to talk, right? It's just... You know, people aren't brave enough to to broach the topic in the way of what they really think, you know, um, which I've never had a problem. But um, but you, you see the point that we're we're heading to something that has been in the process of being set up since the 80s. I mean, we could go further back, but specifically with what Reagan did, because that's Darius. Right in in this context. Yeah, that, that okay. works. Right. Yeah. Now, now we can also parallel, um, and one of the things that you know that Jeff did a bit of, but we can look at what happens with Darius. I mean, I mean, we did it. It it's seventeen ninety eight, not just five thirty seven, right? Right. Repeating itself. Right. So so we can see that 1989 repeats what happened in 1798. And, and so we can't really get that history. So if we look at 1798, do we see the parallels that we have in 1989 and onward? Right. 
right? Because we, we dealt with them already in the history of the decrees. Right. <clears throat> so if we start to see this, if, so I'm going to try to tie this up, this question, because this has really been one question. So when we go back and we look at, um, you know, what Colin was actually presenting that he didn't realize he was presenting, um, this is, is what? What is he presenting? And how does, how does this relate to Odilio's message? And what would we then look for as the empowerment of this first message? Because in order to know what this empowerment of this message is, because we have Collins and Odilio's messages there, but we have to know what they were because something happens that empowers these messages. It should be really obvious to us, especially if you look at 1629, which was what we talked about yesterday. Right, it's this number that Odilio found. Now, I believe the empowerment has already occurred of this first message. And that the second message has already arrived and we're in the time of the second message based upon this line. So what is that we, February 12th date again? February 12th, 2022. What, what is it? Um, That's Odilio's presentation. Okay. Right. So he's going to present the mandates and he's going to have this and we're going to have that connected to So I'll do it shorter. Okay, so why is November 24, 2022, the empowerment of Odilio's and Colin's message, if that's correct? Because we've already dealt with this a lot. All right, it's Thanksgiving Day. Yes, I know we touched this a couple of times. Yeah, I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to put my name there. And why do I put my name there? Presentation, something clarity came to you. Okay, well, this goes back to the study of the, the Thanksgiving Day prediction in 2018. Okay. Right. Which is the only reason why I would look at November 24th, 2022, and then examine it. Because I've already understood the significance of that date, not November 24th, but Thanksgiving. And we're going to get that 682688 number, right? Application for the additional extension of time. Right. So how does that empower Odilio's and Colin's message? You know, because I had other options. I mean, I could have looked at the studies that I did on the presidents of the United States and different things like that. But one is we have that number 61629 leading to November 24th, 2022, right? 1629, yes, I remember that one. 
right? Because because we looked at that um, dealing with two things. When time setting came into the movement, June 9th, 2018. And so if we go to November 24th, 2022, we can see it's 1,629 days. So Odilio gave us this symbol, right? But this symbol brings us to November 24th, 2022. Now, I didn't, I didn't get November 4th, 24th, 2022 by counting 1,629 days from June 9th, 2018. That was a confirmation of it. So how did I arrive at November 24th, 2022? Anniversary, wasn't it? Okay, so we were dealing with anniversary ideas. Yeah. Because I remember the December 25th, 2021. And then we just we were discussing the anniversaries and that date came up. Right. So one is uh, the four year anniversary from June 9th, 2018 is June 9th, 2022, which is 168 days before November 24, 2022. So basically, yes, I was looking at anniversaries. And so I looked at this date because of Thanksgiving, right? And then we found all of these symbols. So we found that it was 273 days from the start of the Ukrainian-Russian war, right? And 168 days after June 9th, 2022. Um, 11,900 11, days from a date that symbolically is the 26th day of the fourth month, April 26, 1990, which is 100. 168 days after November 9th, 1989, right? So you can see the two 168s, okay? That means, that means something, right? Okay, and 2688 is 168 times 16. Um, Right. Then we also have this 1,533 days from April 26th, um, 1990 to and July. We put that 168 in uh, representing a week. Yes, the number of hours in a week. Right. Right. And, you know, I have this April 26th, 1533 BC, Israel leaves Egypt. So I get that 1533 date. Um, I can't remember what the July 7th, 1994 date is again. I know it's the 27th day of the third month. I think that might just be the symbol there. Um, but we just have tons of symbols that come together. The 859 days, which is 1533 in base eight from July 18th to November 24th. But the main thing, the main kicker, you know, to use some colloquialisms, is uh, November 24, 2022 is 2,688 days before April 5th, 2030. And that, that number, 2688, is this additional extension of time or application for the additional extension of time in the American tax system. And why is that important? Well, adding time. Yeah, so we're adding time to this movement. Right, and we know it's 16 times 168. And Iran says 1260 minus 70 is 1190. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so 
So I'm saying that on that November 24th date, after the election and the failures of that election, we look at this Thanksgiving day that's coming up and we see that it has all of these symbols to pass symbolic dates. You know, it's 1111 days after November 9th, 2019. That's not insignificant. Okay. So, can we say that this um, this date then empowers, because it gives us these structures that that help us um, understand or give more confirmation to uh, Collins and Odilio's studies. It's a confirmation of Odilio's number. And it relates to April 5th, 2030, right? Which is this date that I've been studying for, you know, since 2018 anyway. <clears throat> So now where we have the problem that we're going to have to face is what are these future events? You know, what is the second message? When did it arrive? How can we define it? And then what would be its formalization and empowerment? Are there still future? Right. So we're looking at a line that is still future. Right. So any questions, any thoughts? Right, and if we remember, you know, that this Samson and Delilah line is a zoom into April 5th, 2030, right? It's a zoom into that. Now, so just, you know, thinking about this before or tomorrow, we could just say the second angel arrives April 5th, 2030. Or we could say the third angel arrives April 5th, 2030. Or the fourth angel arrives April 5th, 2030. We could say all those things, but we have no idea at this point, right? So we're going to look at that a little bit more if we can, you know, like tomorrow and uh, Thursday. But I think we should be done with Samson by then, unless something comes up. Right. So, and, and you see what I mean, right? That, that now we start to look into the future. Well, it's going to be a lot more difficult to know what, what those events are. But when we look at Samson and Delilah, the story, we're gonna see that there is a repetition of these lines, right? There's a lot of repeat and enlarge in this one chapter. And then we have to see what verses uh, give us these symbols that we can mark November 24th and February 12th. How do we how do we put the verses with that? So any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay. Yeah, I want to apologize if I you apologize for what? I want to apologize if it seems like I'm yelling. No, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Thanks. Everybody. Sorry about my puppies. It's okay. Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this study. And we pray for your continued guidance throughout this week as we look at these things in the story of Samson and Delilah. And um, we just ask, Lord, that you can uh, continue to teach us as we study personally and that any corrections that Need, need to be made or any insights that could be added 
um, can be added. Be with each person today. May your angels watch over them. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.